Okay. How is everybody doing? Well, thank you. We can take ourselves off of mute because uh, it's a small, we're not that big a group. We can uh, make it work. So has everybody, I didn't hear anyone because I, I think everybody was muted. How is everybody doing? I'm glad to be here. Or maybe that's, you know what, this is also possibly a test that my speaker is not set up to the right place, which often happens. Yes, it went to the wrong place. And there we go. I can hear people now. How's everybody doing? Good. How about you? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> um, sometimes my computer reverts to thinking to uh, for the speaker to my monitor, which doesn't have a speaker. So you think, I, I keep thinking it would figure that out, but apparently um, it has not figured that out yet. So maybe someday it will understand <laughs> on its own. But, uh, so we're all good? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, okay, let me, um, I wish I could split the screen, that'd be really cool. Well, why don't we, uh, last week, was it last? No, last week we didn't have class, but two weeks ago, uh, we kind of abbreviated class because we had a very small turnout. It was the week of Passover. Um, so we're going to stay with the first Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, chapter four, um, which we started last time. So what we'll do is we'll go back and forth between uh, my sharing the screen with that text and our ability to discuss it. Okay. Very good. Hey, Don. So Don Urenson should be join is joining us as well. Hey, Don. I'll get on board in a second. So um, let me begin by sharing the screen with. Um, Hold on a second. There we go. Well, t tell me what what do you prefer? Do you prefer that I share the screen like this and we discuss, or that I put the text in the chat so you can download it? This looks good to me. Yeah, me too. I agree. Okay. Well, not a problem. If somebody would like the text, I can easily put it into the, the chat, I think. Well, um, it, okay. it is in uh, uh, Sidur Sim Shalom on page 268. It is. You can also put, you can also pull it up if you have the, a, a copy of the Sidur as well, because uh, Pirkei Avot is in uh, most every Sidur for Shabbat because it's the tradition to study uh, Pirkei Avot on the Shabbatot between Passover and uh, either Shavuot or Rosh Hashanah depending on your approach. Um, so if I and, have uh, where's Pirkei Avot? Oh, so in that edition you'd want to look in the first in the first teaching of chapter 4. Okay yeah it does but what does it start with? Ben Zoma Omer? Yes. Does it, ha it doesn't have it in chapters? It says, Perak Revi'i, call Yisrael. Yeah, that would be it. Ben Zoma Omer. Oh, exactly. I got it. Okay. It's just written different. Looks different. Okay. So, um, Ben Zoma, um, he goes about answering the question. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about answering the question, um, but um, so he was a, a rabbi, a Tana, 
um, meaning he taught in the time of the Mishnah, in between the first and second centuries of the Common Era in Eretz Israel. So he is, um, we're, we're going right historically in line, right? When, when we were looking at um, Rabban Gamliel and his generation, this would be the next generation. Probably knew this, you know, the, the link to the next generation. So Ben Zoma gives us four teachings. Um, the first one is who is wise, answering the question who is wise. The second one who is mighty, the third one who is rich, and the fourth one who is honored. Um, so on one, before we begin, a nice question to begin to start ourselves off with is, you know, Ben Zomi here, kind of like a, a graph, picks four axes, well, I guess four arms of an axis, graph really has two axes, right? But, you know, four arms of it um, to measure by, right? Being uh, the four measures of life being wisdom, power, wealth, and honor. Wisdom, power, wealth, and honor. So are these the are these the four? Like does he get it right that these are the most the four most important um, categories to maybe not important, but the four most likely categories to um, to measure our life by? Or is he missing something? I think he's missing compassion. Who's speaking? Beverly from Statesville, my Capel's daughter. Hey, Beverly, how you doing? All right, how are you? So, yeah, so compassion, right? Um, that's a, a distinct possibility. That's definitely rose in my mind as well. Um, is, it, is, is he missing compassion? Um, so he might be missing compassion, but he also might not be. That's an interesting question to get into. What about decency, honesty? We have, so compassion, decency. What was the last one, Don? Honesty. Honesty. So I think. Or sincerity. Sincerity. So honesty, sincerity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think that we'll, what we want to examine these for, besides getting into the depth of them in particular and the, the wisdom that they offer, um, when we look at uh, either these three other attributes or any other ones that we decide along the way um, aren't included, um, are two things. One is. Is it possible that this attribute is subsumed underneath one of these four? Meaning, is it, is it possible to see compassion, decency, or honesty, sincerity as part of one of these other four? I'm not expressing an opinion, just I think that's one way we can analyze it. And another way to analyze it is this. Um, given the method of Benzoma's teaching, do these attributes belong here? Okay. So given, does that, I don't know if that makes sense or not to everybody, but um, given uh, what Benzoma seems to be teaching, when we get through it, right? This is a question we can't answer until we've studied the whole Mishnah. But given what Ben Zoma is teaching, or his message, um, do compassion, decency, and honesty slash sincerity belong, or something else? And I don't know the answer to that question yet, but we'll let's consider it, okay, as we go through. So, uh, Don, why don't you read? Would you read the first teaching for us? Who is wise? Those who learn from everyone. As well, could, could you use the, the text that we have on the on the sheet that oh, we were all this Okay, time? I'm reading. Yeah, I'm reading from the book. Okay. Uh, okay. Just, I still like uh, reading from paper, frankly. Okay. Yeah. Who is wise? One who learns from every person, as it as is written, as it is written, from all who taught me, have I gained understanding. 
for your testimonies are my study. Yes. From Psalms. Wait, right, that's Psalm 119. Okay. As you can see, Psalm 119 is a very long psalm. It's like, I don't know, 150 verses or so. Um, okay, so let's first understand the verse from Psalms, uh, from the psalm in its context, and then see how it is that the rabbis use it, or how, how is it that Ben Zoma uses it. So, Don, if you were going to take the, the poetic language of the psalm and put it just in a, a paraphrase, like to put it in your own words, can you sum it up? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, so can you take the verse from the psalm, psalm verse 99, psalm 119, and just put it in your own words? Oh. Um, Okay, well, the first part uh, is a little poetic. From the first part, uh, basically, one can learn from everybody. Uh, there's always something to learn from every person that we encounter. There's something, some uh, kernel of gold. From all who taught me, I have gained understanding. Okay. I, your testimonies are my study. I'm not sure I understand that last sentence. Okay, so let's, let's break it apart. And I'm wondering, though, if you're reading the first part of the verse in the context of knowing what Ben Zoma says already. Uh, Meaning, right, you are, you, Don, because you said from, I, you can learn from everyone is kind of what you put in, you summed up from the beginning, right? Yeah, that's what I see in the writing in front of me. Yes. And, and, and I agree with that. Uh, oh, I like it as, a, I like it as a sentiment, right? I definitely like it as a sentiment and as a teaching of Ben Zoma above. But I'm, what I'm curious about, or what I'm critical about here, is whether the verse from Psalms really is saying that, or if Benzoma is going to do something, kind of reinterpret it a little bit. Okay, I don't know what Psalms says. I don't have Psalms in front of me. So I'm not sure I understand what, what Psalms actually is saying. Oh, so the translation that you see within the quotation marks? From all who taught me. Yes. Right? Okay. From yes. all who taught me. Have I gained understanding? For your testimonies are my study. So that's, sorry, yeah, let me, let me step back then. That is the verse from the Psalm. Oh, okay, all right. Right, so Benzoma is everything before that. Why is your capitalized? What in the Hebrew? And is, is your supposed to be God? Yes. But so the, the your is God, but let me, if I can just get to that in a second, but that's a very good question to raise because it's not, otherwise God is not explicitly in the, the verse, right? But when we look at this verse from the Psalm, from all who have, who taught me, have I gained understanding? Okay. Right, so, I, yeah, I see the distinction that you're making now. Yes. Okay. Now I, I get it. So can you put that, make sure we're all on the same page because I don't, I don't know if everybody else gets it too. Well, uh, okay, so just looking at his part and not the part that he's quoting, okay. So who is wise? One who learns from every person. Um, mm, I think he's partially correct. <laughs> I, think, I think wise people do learn from everybody, but I think it's how you interpret what you're learning. What you're learning is is also a, a big factor in in what is considered wisdom, and who is wise. Uh, there's lots of things to learn from people, and how do you distinguish what is untrue and 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 not um, wisdom? And you know, uh -huh. how do you sort out what is wisdom and what is baloney? Right. And what does that take? What does that take? Yeah, what does it take to sort those things out? True wisdom. <laughs> true wisdom. Okay, true wisdom. 
which would get to mind. Yeah, in other words, I think a critical mind, right? Right. So critical mind and some sort of true wisdom, right? Um, And I think both of those are really right on uh, right on the money. So, um, but here we have. um, So we what we have. I want to make sure we understand kind of what's going on in the kind of the the machinations of each of these teachings, right? Because it's a very good way to kind of, especially it's so clear here. It's a very good way to understand how the rabbis are working with scripture. Okay. And I think that it's even more beautiful here because the whole measure of the rabbinic enterprise as we're seeing it reinforces the teaching of Ben Zoma. It's kind of like what Ben Zoma is doing to some degree, right? And what that is, is it, it requires when we took, when we look at something, if we're going to look, if we're going to study from everyone and we're going to learn from everyone, that means even the people we disagree with, even the people we see, it means we've got to learn from President Trump or from, um, from Bernie Sanders. Um, we have to learn from both of them. I'm just throwing them up there as populist poll opposites, right? Because that way, no matter what your politics are, you're going to be upset, right? Um, there's someone out there to learn from who you fundamentally, not only fundamentally disagree with, but probably think is a moral um, black mark on society, right? But we have to learn from them. So how do how do we learn that that you know that requires us to as you know use our critical mind, and to have something that's some sort of absolute truth that we are balancing it off of, by which we interpret the person's actions, and then uh, learn. And really, again, I wanted to interject and say that you almost answered B's question by saying that um, he's taking what we're actually studying, what he's actually studying is scripture and scripture being the original meaning or the plain text meaning is very difficult to comprehend because a lot of times it's missing information, um, it's out of context, etc. So we had to take the Mishnah and study from the rabbis to not only help us fill in the missing content and gain a better understanding of what Hashem meant to say in the Torah, but Mm -hmm. also to get those different perspectives, like you said, and bring it current to the times of the people. This is how we keep Judaism alive, by yeah. reinterpreting and retranslating. By making it more meaningful in the, in the, in the new day, right? Just like um, someone who updates uh, Shakespeare and tells it in modern day. Exactly. Right? That's a way of make, taking those words and making it meaningful. So you know, here we have Psalm 119. Right? And so what I want to, I guess what I wanted to make sure we understood is that in Psalm 119, it doesn't say learn from everyone. Right? What does it say? It says... All if, teachers. If, if you're... Uh, Fran. Yeah. If your actions line up with God, then you are wise. Okay, so you're putting... So, uh, Fran, what I hear you doing is putting p- both clauses of the verse from the psalm together in a nice way, in a contextual way, right? I have, but if I want to break it down a little bit even more, just to be really kind of um, very literal, the first half of the of the verse says, "I've learned from all who have taught me." I've learned from all of my teachers. Right. But not everyone is wise. And you, and your testimonies are my study. Right. That's what the verse says, right? So I've learned from all of my teachers and your 
uh, testimonies are my study. The thing that I, I mean, study here is a bad translation because it's sikhali, um, or my conversation, or my meditation. Right? Lisoach um, is, is the verb. We don't see it very often in the Torah, but it's the one, I believe, where, um, where Yitzchak is, uh, after the death of Sarah, is out walking in the field in the afternoon, and uh, Rebecca is brought uh, back from the home country to marry him, and he is, uh, and that's where they have their first interaction, and it seems to be love at first sight, and the Torah uses the verb lisoach for what Yitzchak is doing out in the field, which we've always interpreted, because he's by himself, um, and it seems to be a conversational word, so we always use it to think of it as meditation, right? So in some ways, it might be a better way to say, your testimonies are my meditation. And I learned from all my teachers and your teachings, and that's why I capitalized the Y, uh, B, because I think here, especially in the Psalm, it has to only, it, it can only make sense to be God's, te God's testimonies are my conversation. So I have another book that has Rashi in it, and it says, oh. it talks about the fact that the Psalm part is that he's learned from teachers, people who are greater than him. Whereas yes. Ben Zoma is saying, one who learns from every person. So a wise person will learn even from those who are not as great as he, for he's mm -hmm. not ashamed to seek knowledge from any source. So that would be kind of the distinction, I think, between Ben Zoma and what's in Psalms. And the Psalm, exactly. So here is what we, I think what we see is that as Peter and uh, Don and I think Fran, well, let's give the credit to everybody, right? As we've noticed, uh, the verse has two different sides. One is I learned from my teach. I've learned from all my teachers and hey, like, um, I mean, I've probably learned something from everyone who thinks of themselves as a teacher of mine, right? But have I been really, have I been, uh, have I fully tried to learn as much as I could from every teacher I've ever had? Um, I probably haven't, um, being, you know, bare, you know, being honest about it. I probably haven't. Um, so I don't even know if I've even lived up to the psalm, let alone to Ben Zoma's teaching. But we, we have this idea that I should learn from all of my teachers on the one hand and that God's teachings should be my meditation, okay, on the other. And I'm going to propose that um, that, is, that represents the tension between what Don was saying and Peter was, say, was saying about uh, that um, we have the, the rational mind but we also, and we also have the kind of absolute truth that we're supposed to weigh things up against. Right to kind of keep us on the to keep us within boundaries, and um, it doesn't work out neatly a hundred percent. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in that balance between these two things. Okay. So, but Benzoma then takes that, and he adds another layer. Right. So Benzoma see he wants to you know. Whether it is that Ben Zoma was reading the psalm and had a brilliant insight, right? Mikolam de Hiskalti, from all my teachers, I've learned. What do you mean from all my teachers? I've, I should be learning from every single person, right? Did Ben Zoma have that experience reading the psalm? I don't know, right? Or did he have this inclination, this idea that we should learn from everyone observing um, and trying to gain knowledge from our um, from every single person, whether it's positive examples or negative examples, um, that we should be trying to learn from everyone. Did he have that insight, and then he went looking for a place to put it, and he found it here? Um, I don't know. Do, do you see the? And I'm not sure that distinction matters at all. Um, although I do think that given that the verse begins with mikol melamde, right? From all, mikol means from all. Melamde, my teachers, right? He's not 
from all my teachers I have learned, right, Ben Zoma is not totally rewriting the, the verse. He's just reinterpreting what the literal meaning of Malam Day would be, which would be teachers, right? He's saying, yes, teachers, but everyone should be your teacher. Right, so what Ben Zoma is doing, and that's the, this is a great example of the rabbinic enterprise, right? Is he's just reinterpreting it to give, to give the, the message he thinks it, that it belongs here, that he, he, he wants to give. Yeah. Well, he's, al he's also flipping it around. Uh, the psalm talks about um, um, the, the, the principle. One is active and, and the other is somewhat passive in, in quotation marks. In other words, uh, he, he's talking about all who teach. But that's the sort of the giving part uh, of, of learning. Whereas in the, in the first part, he's talking about learning, which is sort of, if you will, the passive in quotation marks. Okay. And that was you're receiving. Learning is receiving. Teaching is, is giving in, in, in a sense. Uh, I guess that's what uh -huh. I'm trying to say. So he's changed okay. the, the, if you will, the, the verb part of it a, a, a bit. From yeah. That, teaching is an active thing. Learning is the receptive part of that process. So who, who does he put the onus upon in that switch? Uh, well, uh, the, 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 the recipient of, of teaching. <laughs> right, yeah. It, it could be self-serving to the teacher, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but um, as, a, as wisdom literature, as, a, as advice for how to go about life is pretty good. But... What else does Benzoma, what does Benzoma leave out completely? Uh, if, we, if we take his teaching and think of it in some way as a rephrasing of the verse from Psalms, he kind of leaves something out, doesn't he? Or he assumes it. The studying part or the thinking, how am I going to act based on what I'm learning? Perhaps, right? That I that maybe, but where do you see that in the verse uh, from the psalm? Well, he says your test in the psalm. It says your testimonies are my study. Yes. I kind of feel more like it's out there rather than bringing it in. Kind of to to decide, like to think about it for myself. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious, B. What is um the the version of Pirkei you have there? Does it do anything with the second part of the verse from Psalms? Um, for your testimonies are my study, or does it just leave it off? Um, it says from all my teach yeah from all my teachers I have gotten understanding. You're right. It just it it there, right? It leaves it there, and let me see the other one. Um, um, yeah, both of them leave it off. So, does everyone, I just want to make sure everyone understands what we're saying is that. Um, in the other versions of the psalm, I mean, of, of Pirkei Avot, that B is looking at, the highlighted section here, right, the section that I've highlighted here, is not quoted or referred to in the teaching. Right, the second half of the verse from the psalm is just kind of ignored. Right, and that's the way it is in the prayer book, too. It's and that is in the prayer book, too, right? Yeah. yeah. So... And that could be the way it was meant. It's, it, we can't really know. Um, one of the challenges we have with rabbinic literature especially is that when they would quote things, um, when they would quote a verse or a section of verse, they would almost always just use the first few words as the citation. Now, it's a, a testament to their 
their memory, or perhaps it's more a testament to the lack of distraction um, of television and other things, um, right, that they could do so and then know the verse that was being discussed or the section of, of, this, of the Torah that was being discussed. And we might be able to do that a little bit, right? Because if I said, you know, Rabbi Ben Gideon teaches that loving your neighbor means, uh, no, sorry, that loving God means studying Torah. As it's written, et dot, dot, dot. Right? If I did that, so I quote the beginning of the Ve'ahavta, the Shema, right? That's something that we, at least the Jews in the room, would know, right? Because it's such a very common section of the, of the liturgy that you would know that and you could and function with that reference point, right? But that's how they did every quotation. And the challenge is, not, is, is multiple. One is no, finding it, which, thank God, we have centuries of rabbis and uh, scholars who have uh, found out, you know, who have used chapter and verse to tell us where these quotes are coming from. That's number one, because uh, those weren't in the original text. Like if, when you study Talmud and someone has a citation that tells you chapter and verse, right, that wasn't originally in the Talmud. Somebody went back and added that in about 200 years ago. Um, so the one thing we, so the one thing we don't have is a citation like that. The second thing we don't have is where the quotation ends. Right? They don't tell us necessarily where they're stopping the quote. They're just telling us what they're quoting, or at least the beginning part. So um, here, while it's impossible to know from Ben Zoma, because he, you know, whether he meant. Uh, to only include the first three words of the verse, or he meant to really balance it against the whole verse. We don't know, but we can see that three different editions of Pirkei Avot have made the decision that they're only going to worry about the first part. Okay? So, we could take that as, uh, as, as something that uh, can help us say, well, in this instance, we don't have to worry about the second part of the verse. Is, is, is a possible reason, you know, as I try to make sense out of the last part, I still not sure I see the connection. And maybe that's why it was left off because yes, maybe other exactly. people had trouble, trouble seeing the connection as well. And they felt it sort of took away from the, what is maybe the more easily understandable part of the of, of what he's trying to say here? Exactly. I think you're Don. I think you're right on the money. It's exactly that that um, Ben Zoma just seems to ignore it because he's only talking about who is wise, one who learns from everyone. Um, now we could go, I mean, we could come up with some reasons why we want to include the second part of the verse probably and get creative about it. But, you know, just off the top of my head, um, well, you got to learn from God too. And God's not a person, but, right? I don't know. Like, we could just get creative with it. But, okay. So, how do we like Ben? I think we, we seem to like Ben Zoma's teaching, his expansion of the psalm to go from learning from all of our teachers to learning from everyone. Does everybody kind of dig that teaching? Yes. Yes. Yeah, me too. I like it a lot. Um, can, and let, let me then ask, can we see either compassion, decency, or honesty slash sincerity fitting into this, uh, this teaching? Not directly. No, I, I can't make that connection. I could see a little compassion in that it's not saying you can only learn from teachers, but I think it's compassionate to say you can learn something from everybody. Mm -hmm. I might, this is, this is Fran, I might have an example that's current. In Scotland, there was a uh, married Muslim couple who when the virus hit, they took their savings 
and made sure their neighbors had food, masks, and things of that nature. So we would say that wasn't a wise thing to do to take all your savings, but that's what they did. And uh, to me, that was very wise. Mm. That's beautiful. Why? Well, from, <laughs> yeah. from God's perspective, that's wise not from a human perspective. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I think on one level, right, it is possible to learn from every person, even if you don't value them right. as people. It's possible. And I think that valuing other people is certainly at the core of the three different uh, values that, we, that were brought up as not represented here, right? I think compassion, decency, and honesty, and sincerity all demand that we have that we value the the other person. Right. Right. Yes. Not necessarily. You know, you can learn from people that you don't. You know, that aren't nice people, that aren't good people, and you may not think well of them as a person, but you can still learn from them. Yeah, I'm sorry, Don. I was trying to say exactly that. Right. That. You're, that's what I hear you saying, Ray, is that well, you, yeah, I, you can I guess learn I'm questioning the word value. Uh, you know, I mean, you can value them for their wisdom, but you may oh. not think that, that they're a very nice person. <laughs> and there's a lot of those people around, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> but, okay, so does valuing them as a – so I was going to go further and say you can, you can learn from someone and not value them at all as a human being. I guess we're saying the same thing, just with a semantic you difference. Can, yeah, value them as a human being, but you may not have much value for them as a decent, kind, compassionate, you know, honest person. Are you saying them as compassionate, decent, or honest, or yourself? I'm sorry, say that again? So I was going from the angle that, when we're talking here about compassion, decency, and honesty, um, since we're talking about like who is wise, we're talking about an internal um, attribute, right? So yeah. I was asking, does my being wise require me to also be compassionate, to be decent, or to be honest or sincere? Right? No, no I think they're, they're all... Uh, and you're saying no. And I'm saying I can see that, but I think it's not easy. I think people can be wise in, in, in certain ways, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, you know, <laughs> that they have the other attributes that, that I would associate with being a, a good, decent human being. Yeah, I, I hear you. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue it like it's an absolute. I'm saying, I'm getting, what I'm suggesting is that here you can be a person who learns from everyone else, even if you don't value their lives. But I think it's easier to learn from everyone else when we do value the other people. Well, I think we're more likely to learn from everyone else when we, are, when we bring compassion, decency, and honesty and sincerity to the conversation. Don't we still learn from people that we don't like? We learn we don't want to be like that. Yeah, right, so that's one way of learning from them. I think that, I guess I would suggest that that's kind of like a first level, but if I really want to learn from everyone, I have to learn more like what's behind them, even though I disagree with them fundamentally, um, what's their motivation, what are they trying to accomplish, um, right, where is, where is the wisdom in what they're trying to do? And not just see my own correct, what I perceive as the correct answer as being um, the only righteous possibility. So going along with what you're saying, it's kind of being open-minded and learning by watching what other people are doing and maybe deciding if, if they are being compassionate. Um, I think it depends how wide you're willing to say, 
the learning is. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's, if we put ourselves on the spot here, let's, let's try to um, focus on the moment and ask ourselves, I'm presuming that we all are sh doing the right thing here and sheltering in, in place. And I don't think that should be a political statement to say that following these restrictions are the right thing to do. Um, I think they are the religious course of action is protection of life. Um, so I can't, even though other people are trying to make it into a political idea or a political value, I don't see it as politics. I think, I think it's just sensible and, and the religious course of action. Um, but we, we had people protesting, you know, not that many, a few hundred in different cities about against tyranny and against uh, of the tyranny of the government, trying to tell them what to do. Um, and I'm, I would wonder, as much as I'm guessing all of us vehemently disagree with not only their position, but their course of action and their behavior as being dangerous, um, is there some wisdom in it that we can learn? I think that's a, a good moral conundrum for all of us, probably. <laughs> They're reminding of us of our civil liberties, um, which have kind of been taken away, but I've been looking at it as a social contract that just like, you know, if we were at war, we could be drafted type thing. We have a social contract with our country and our country has been working their end of the social contract. Had they had to take away some of our liberties? Yes, but for the greater good. Wow, so let me go crazy then and say, these people then are acting, they are kind of in the role of conscientious objectors during the war. Right, and they're willing to go to jail, so to speak, and the jail being the likelihood of getting the virus because they're congregating together. Mm -hmm. um, they're willing to go to jail to make their point. I think we're all kind of like, I think it's a good stretch, right? This is a good exercise. Um, but so, I, okay, I, I just wanted to see if we could, if we could push it there. Um, anyone else, before we go on to Ben Zoma's next teaching, does anyone else have a... Well, this is Fran. I think their actions show us that any good action can be misunderstood and become, you know, wrong. They've interpreted the action as being uh, evil or authoritarian, but if you're abiding by it, you are interpreting the actions as this is keeping us safe. Yeah. So it's the old problem of good and evil. <laughs> it's the old problem of good and evil, and also that we're not all, and it's a, it's a very, sadly, a, a powerful example of um, that we're all not functioning from the same information. Right, I don't, there was an article in the journal on Shabbos, I think, or yesterday, I forget if it was Shabbat or yesterday, about different attitudes around um, the, the measures that we've taken as a society based on political affiliation. Yeah. And that um, if, you were on, if you were a Democrat or identified as a Democrat, you had a much higher approval rating of the steps that were taken and much less concern about opening the government, uh, kind of restarting the economy um, than if you were a Republican. Now, is that because of the news that you're seeing based on the party that you affiliate with, presuming that if you're a Republican, you're watching Fox more, and if you're a Democrat, you're watching CNBC more? Or is it because the interests and the values that put you into that group give you, have you valuing different things and seeing the, the, the various um, issues out there 
um, differently with a different uh, valuation, a different point system, so to speak. I, I, yeah, obviously this is a very complicated issue where we could spend probably who knows how many hours. But let me try to boil it down to a couple of points. And I, and I don't mean to think that this is sums up the whole thing. But I think they're, what I see in the protesters, the, the people that are uh, demonstrating against the government, there's two issues here. I think, and the main issue may be self-interest, but the people out there aren't, you know, old folks like us, <laughs> excluding you, Rabbi, uh, who are retired, you know, and who aren't dependent upon having a job and having an open society because they're, they're threatened, I mean, rightfully so, their yeah. livelihoods, you know, their savings, their health care. I mean, I can see where they would be desperate. And it's not ideological. It's practical. It's self, for them, it's self-survival. It's, you know, for them, it's, it's, you know, maybe being alive is 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 one thing, but this is pretty close to dying. If if they are, you know, if their businesses go under, everything they've worked for, and all the things that follow from that go down the tubes, this is self-interest. Okay, and I think that's probably the main thing, and maybe it's disguised a little bit as, well, you know, the government doesn't have the right to do this. You know, maybe that's a secondary issue. I don't know if there are many people out there who are who are protesting because of ideology. I think it's, for them, it's self-survival. Um, and they're not necessarily concerned about what's gonna happen as a consequence of a um, poorly thought out, um, um, somewhat, you know, you know, a very poorly, <laughs> a poorly timed, poorly thought out how we're gonna reintegrate into society because the consequences are gonna be absolutely devastating if we open up. I think, you know, you'd have to be an idiot not to see that. Uh, you know, look, look, at the, look at the toll that has occurred with all the social distancing that's occurred. And so, I mean, if we open up society, it's gonna be, it will be in the millions of deaths. It really will be. I mean, you can do the math. Everybody gets infected, we have 300 million people. You know, if you think about a 1% infection rate, that's 3 million, you know, yeah. uh, or not a, not a, not a 1%, not infection. you think, you think about a 1% death rate up to that if, if everybody gets infected. And now you're talking yes. about 3 million, 3 million deaths, you know, as a rough ballpark. Yeah. I mean, anyway, <laughs> so I think it's yeah. self-interest basically to, to summarize my rambling. Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> yes, I think it's, I think you put it well. And I, I'd contrast what you just said with not your teaching versus France, what France has taught before, but the examples brought, the behavior of the people protesting here versus the behavior of the Muslim couple in Scotland, right? And saying, you know, I'm going to help provide for other people so that this isn't the concern, so that we can all be safe and i think that's uh I, I think don your identification of self-interest here is really um on the money right and how do we and, and that would be a, it would be nice if our society and our government could do a better job of reassuring people that their self-interest will be that their interests will be protected at least to a moderate to a moderate degree um despite the measures that have to be taken well, I think the trick is how do you how do you integrate society and then people protect it? And I think there needs to be a lot more thinking about that. You know, how does somebody cut? cut you know, already the the grocery stores have done a little bit of intervention. You know, they're now wearing masks and and gloves, and they've put up these plexiform uh, plexiglass uh, shields. So they've already made some adaptations, and I think we that's where we a lot more thinking has to go into it. I mean, what we're doing today is a way of adapting to the new yeah. reality. And, and we need, need a lot more of that, I think, to, to allow businesses to um, open up in a, in a wise, <laughs> um, well thought out way. That's what we need more of until we hopefully get some sort of medical uh, intervention that's worthwhile. I'd also add testing, right? We need the biggest, one of the biggest faults of the, the federal government's response 
has been not to mobilize um, industry to make the first priority developing uh, tests, you know, te to make testing widely available. Right, because without it, you have a, a totally, I mean, that's what we're doing right now. I think that's the point. It's, it's uh, you know, there is no, it, it's a mass <laughs> uh, withdrawal from, from society. Whereas if you have the results of tests and the tests have to be reliable and you can scale it up to the unbelievable numbers that yeah. are needed here, then yes, then you can go back to doing what epidemiologists have done, you know, long ago and that is separating out people who are infectious yep. and not tar you know targeted uh you know intervention rather than a, a mass uh type of intervention which is what we're going all the way back to the torah right we have that in the torah um isolation of people who are contagious yeah. so um, it's a really interesting article in the Times this morning about um, using a pulse oximeter to check oxygen levels in the blood and that if they could get people to the hospital earlier or start working on helping them earlier with the COVID, then they wouldn't have so many overly sick and dying people. Right, and that's, that right there is also a change of course, right? Because just a, a few weeks ago, in New York, they were telling everyone, because they were so overwhelmed, either the EMTs or the hospitals, like, unless you have problems breathing, stay home. Mm -hmm. Right, because, and that was just, they were trying to deal with the crisis in that moment. And we're just learning and adapting each day yeah. um, to, to figuring things out differently. So shall we, uh, shall we go to Ben Zoma's second teaching? We have like five minutes, or should we leave that for next week? <laughs> I guess we, we could leave that for now. Why don't we leave it for next week? Because it says, it's a, it's, there are, each of these, I mean, one of the beautiful things about this um, teaching of Ben Zoma is um, just how sharp I think it is, how brilliant and how um, applicable to life today. And his wisdom literature, his, 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 um, prescription for how to live a meaningful life um, 1800 years ago is just as applicable and just as um, necessary, if not more so today. Um, and I think that's there's just, it's amazing in that way, um, which is why you see these quotes all over the place um, in Jewish tradition, especially like if you're in Israel. Um, Where would do you, you like? In Israel, when hmm? you say when you say you see it everywhere in Israel, where would it, it be? Or? I mean, you know, I think um, <clears throat> in the, you know, for uh, and forgive me, uh, Carla and Francis and Margaret, um, but Jewishly speaking, right? Um, I, I'm reflecting on uh, being in Israel two years ago uh, for Yom HaShoah. And for Yom Ha'atzma'ut, well, Yom HaShoah in Poland and in Yom Ha'atzma'ut in uh, the, the Israel's Day of Independence, like 4th of July for, for them in Israel, um, a week later. So that's going to be next Tuesday, um, uh, tonight, a week from tonight. Um, and uh, we were at this you were there. big theater, um, this open air theater, uh, amphitheater, with like 10, I don't know, 15,000 people. And it was this production thing on the stage and it was really, really cheesy. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just like, oh God, I can't believe we have to sit through this, right? But what was um, really, uh, one of the things that was really intriguing or I think what occurred to me in that moment was yes, it's cheesy, but it was like our cheesiness. <laughs> Right, like all of the songs, all of the things that were referenced were all Jewish things. And while I'm accustomed to hearing, a, and even like, um, and I guess in America maybe it's not Christian as much as it's more pop culture. Um, you know, it's more secular, more it's kind of like this a different kind of a, a different kind of a collection of texts and songs that are referred to 
when we do like public ceremony, right? It was really neat that uh, all the things that, like as much as I didn't like the cheesiness of the production, um, but that all of it was our cheese, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was a comfort in that. And so what I mean by you see these in Israel is, you know, there might be like a, a, a high school does a t-shirt for a class or something, and they might have a play on Ezehu Hacham, who is the wise person, right? Because it's just so, it's a, a very, um, and, I, and I, my guess is a number of Israelis uh, know the phrase, but have, but probably no idea where it comes from. Right, it's that it's kind of just part of the the civil um, culture, part of the society, and uh, just kind of one that's part of the ether, so to speak, or the fabric. I love good cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I love good cheese. It, can I can yeah. I can I um, make a, make a small point, and uh, it, it sort of connects. Um, two themes here about learning from everybody and also <laughs> ties it in with uh, the current uh, contagion. Uh, there was a piece on TV last night about the uh, Hasidim in Israel oh. and their uh, exercise of their, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> The ideology that, you know, they're not going to have the state tell them what to do. They're going to do their thing as determined by their understanding of, of, I guess, God's directives. And consequences have been devastating for them. Devastating. And, 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 and now they're, you know, unfortunately, they have learned a hard way. I think some of them have learned. But I guess it's a dilemma for them, uh, I, I guess, uh, having to um adapt to to the rules of of the state and not being able to follow whatever the the, the rules of their community um but they've had to adapt otherwise there isn't going to be a community so that's one way to, in a sense to learn from what not to do and i think we should yep. fortunately and that's perhaps a better example than you know, than some of these states that are being looked at that have been very lax in their, you know, trying to uh, physically isolate people. They, they've been rather cavalier about it and they're doing things prematurely. And yet, uh, I, I think there's a lot to be learned from uh, what, what the religious communities have done in Israel and how they have suffered unnecessarily for their, you know, behavior. And their yeah, it's very complex there because you have the mixture of religious community with politics. Yeah. And that, it makes it very hard to, dis, to separate those issues out. Um, and you have a theology from Eastern Europe of uh, kind of a Hasidic slash Haredi approach, which is um, deal with the government only when you have to and govern yourselves use the systems of the civil government, civil society to strengthen your own kind of your, your, uh, your own walls and your own borders. So use it when you can, fight it when necessary and ignore it as much as possible. Sounds similar to some of the behavior of some of the more fundamentalist Christians in the United States. I'm thinking of some churches in Louisiana and Texas that were on the news. Absolutely. And we see it actually in America. As, we see it in the same groups in America as well. Right. If you, if you want to see a really interesting documentary, um, it's called One of Us, which is about three or four different people who leave um, the Satmar community and Satmar is the largest Hasidic community in America. Uh, it might be the largest one in the world and it's the most fundamental. It's one of the most fundamentalist, if not the most fundamentalist. It's of the big Hasidic movements. It's certainly the most fundamentalist um, and it's very similar. In, in fact, um, in uh, to what you were saying, Carla, about fundamentalist Christians as well, right. there are the, the police had to go into certain um, synagogues and 
and dispel or to, you know, to kick people out from having minion, right? So it's, it's happening now in Judaism, Jewish communities as well as in these fundamentalist communities as well. And it's, exact, it's exactly the same tendency um, that you were talking about. It's kind of that fight against, it's a fight against universal, any kind of universal values. Um, and uh, one, some of the stuff, I think it's too early to see what's gonna happen. But Don, some of the things that I've read have suggested that um, what, we're, what people in those communities are, are learning is that there are limits to how far they should follow the rabbinic authority. And they're kind of going more independent now. We'll see how long that sticks around for, you know. Um, I think, you know, unlike, you know, I think that after 9-11, we, everyone freaked out, came together, and then that quickly dispelled um, on some level. But this is a much longer, like, while that, that was a, a horrible day followed by reaction and, 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 uh, and uh, recrimination and, and actions that were based on that day, this is months of time that has, a, while not as horrible any one day compared to the day of, nine, of September 11th, 2001, um, the ability for the regularity of this kind of change over a long period of time to impact our behavior, I think is more powerful. Right, I so I- Eric pointed out too that as tragic as 9-11 was, it didn't necessarily affect all of us directly like it is now because yes, I'm a native New Yorker. So yeah, it affected me a little bit more than somebody that was born and raised here in Statesville. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely true, right? It was a very targeted in, in terms of society. Whereas even though this is more hitting, this is COVID-19 is definitely hitting New York harder than anywhere else. Um, it's spreading and we're seeing it more broadly. Well, thanks. This was a really, it's a great conversation. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and we'll, um, I'm going to stop the share. And uh, next week, we'll pick it up with who is, um, who is powerful, right? Uh, which is, which is a really interesting uh, teaching as well. So everybody have a good day. Um, and uh, thank you. we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Be well. Be safe, everybody. <laughs> you too. Likewise.